It's one of the world's largest and most influential scientific congresses for anesthesiology and intensive care. After two years of virtual editions of the Congress, we're officially back in person in the beautiful city of Milan. The global anesthesia community is finally able to reunite, interact, have face-to-face -face debates and discuss the latest ideas and innovations in the field. It's Euro Anesthesia 2022 and we're Euro Anesthesia TV. Welcome back to Euro Anesthesia TV and Sunday here at Euro Anesthesia 2022 in Milan. Well, we hope you've been enjoying all of the live sessions and learning from experts across the fields of anesthesiology, intensive care, pain and perioperative medicine. And today we have another packed show for you. On today's show, we speak to Professor Lisbeth Everett about her latest study on post-operative delirium. We'll stop by the University Hospital Brussels, Comfort Talk in Massachusetts, and the Irish Critical Care Clinical Trials Network at the University College Dublin. In addition, we get insights into the world's largest clinical anesthesia research organization. And last but not least, we get a first look at Isaac's serious games. First though, as attendees from around the world move into the exhibition hall, let's find out what they're most looking forward to at this year's meeting. To listen to great, great people talking about excellent stuff. I think it's always very interesting to be here because it's one of the best conferences in Europe, I think. And uh, we always hear new, really interesting stuff which is related to our everyday work. It was great to see uh, uh, other exhibitions, uh, uh, to talk about different themes. Meeting all the colleagues again after uh, two heavy years of uh, lockdown, basically. I'm hoping to look at some regional anesthesia technology, but that's, that's the only thing I've come to see. I'm curious because it's my first conference here in the anesthetic field and I'm curious what to see. For me it's the, the chance to interact with different colleagues and have the chance to know what they are doing now in this research. The new sessions, the new things we can hear, uh, uh, new developments, serious gaming probably is going to be very interesting. Well, I'm looking forward to just meeting people in person again because, of course, you know, with the pandemic, we've had so many difficulties. As you know, we couldn't travel anywhere to Euro Anesthesia Live Congresses Barcelona in 2020 and Munich last year were cancelled and only online. And yes, you get the education that way, but you don't quite get the full picture. And the interaction is what brings it in. This is the biggest meeting in Europe, so. I hope I get my the information I'm interested in. I would like to learn about the new evidence uh, because I'm a resident and I think I have a lot to learn. Uh, I'm looking forward to all the interactions with the clinicians that are here and there are symposia about hypotension that I'm very, very interested in attending. Actually, actually being on site and uh, apart from the lectures, having access to, to the, the site here with, with all the representatives and uh, from the different companies which I've missed out on. I'm looking forward to see the new things about obstetric anesthesia and also intensive care. Uh, that's my field of interest. Great to hear from delegates who've made it here to Milan. Now for an interview with Professor Lisbeth Everett, where we discuss the very latest in post-operative delirium. Professor Everett, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Sam, for having me. It's great to be here. So we're talking about post-operative delirium. Could you maybe just start by explaining what it is? Sure. So post-operative delirium is something that happens uh, in the acute time after anaesthesia and surgery. It's an inattention, uh, inability to solve complex problems, often with a, an altered state of consciousness and sometimes with agitation. So some patients are hypoactive, which is the most common form, which is a very sleepy state. And um, some patients do have some agitation, but that's not the most common form. 
And how long after surgery um, is this appearing or becoming a clinical issue? Most commonly it's uh, on the first or second day post-operatively, but it can occur in the initial instance even at five days post-operatively. Generally it resolves in the short term, but then we know there are long-term complications associated with having an episode in that short period after um, surgery. And are there any particular types of surgery or, or anaesthetics that are more likely to bring these on? So we know that um, cardiac surgery, for example, has a higher incidence of post-operative delirium. And we know that the long-term cognitive impairments and increase in mortality occur regardless of, of what type of anaesthesia and surgery the patient has experienced. And what's the current approach then to diagnosis, prevention and, and treatment of post-operative delirium? So at the moment really the only strategies are non-pharmacological interventions to prevent delirium. So making sure patients have, are oriented as soon as possible after their anaesthesia and surgery, after they emerge, uh, making sure they have their sensory aids, so give them their glasses, their hearing aids, their teeth, make them feel oriented to their surroundings and uh, reducing polypharmacy as much as we can. And just finally, where do you think the research is going? There's a lot of work being done globally looking at biomarkers. So blood biomarkers, we now have really sensitive assays, which we didn't have five years ago, looking at both inflammatory biomarkers because it looks to be some sort of neuroinflammation certainly is part of what's driving this but also neuronal damage biomarkers akin to what we see with Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. So that's the really exciting area where hopefully we'll get to understand the pathophysiology of delirium and ultimately be able to implement preventive strategies. Professor Everett, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Sam. It's great to be here. Remember, you can watch Euro Anesthesia TV here at the Milano Convention Centre. Find us on the Euro Anesthesia 2022 website, on the virtual platform, on the meeting app, and on YouTube and Twitter. Now let's go to Belgium and the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine at the University Hospital Brussels where anesthesiologists and trainees are focused on patient-centered care and innovation. For us, patient-centered care is the cornerstone of our organization. We strive to achieve this through teamwork and innovation, as well as high-level education for our trainees. There is a large experience and expertise uh, in pediatric anesthesia. We are very lucky that we work in an academic uh, setting and hospital where you have several facilities to take care of children adequately and with no delay. We try to provide our residents with an, an excellent training. Uh, we try to use the blended learning approach. So we both use um, in-classroom teaching as bedside teaching, as well as uh, simulation training and also some digital uh, forms of teaching. We have now established uh, training modules where anesthesiologists are involved in the post-operative care of patients. Surgical uh, residents are also involved in anesthesiological care. Comfort Talk, developed by Dr. Elvira Lang, trains frontline patient-facing staff on how to help patients reduce their fear and stress pre-op through communication. Let's take a look. Comfort Talk is a combination of very rapid rapport, slight changes in how one talks to patients, and guiding patients in a self-hypnotic relaxation way to access their own inner strengths and their own coping resources. The Comfort Talk technique can reduce anesthesiologist time by reducing the need for sedations outside of the operating room. I think it gives them tools to use when we have an anxious or upset patient and I think it has a really positive effect on their relationship with our patients as well as our patients overall experience. It's helping patients get through MRI exams but it's also showing them wow you people care you're taking the time to comfort me. It's really amazing how words can do that and it's exciting for our patients.
stay tuned to hear more about the Outcomes Research Consortium when I sit down with Director Professor Daniel Sessler. But first, let's go to Ireland to find out more about the work of the Irish Critical Care Clinical Trials Network. The ICC CTN's work to date has had a number of significant positive impacts for patients and their families, clinical practice, society and the economy. Any research group is actually made up for the strength of its members. And in our case, our members are ICU clinicians, nurses and allied health professionals in ICUs working across Ireland, Europe and within, in other collaborating countries. What I enjoy about working with the CTN is that you, you know you're going to make a difference. I'm an ICU nurse for 20 years and what we did 20 years ago and what we do now is very different and that's because of research. So knowing that you, what you're going to do, what we're doing at the bedside is going to make a difference for patients and help improve their outcomes. The majority of our trials are investigator initiated studies. So these are studies that doctors and nurses and allied health at the bedside see as important questions that need to be answered. Well, joining me now is Professor Daniel Sessler, Director at the Outcomes Research Consortium. Professor Sessler, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. I wonder if you could start by telling us about the Outcomes Research Consortium. What is it and what services does it provide? The consortium is the largest clinical anesthesia research group in the world. We have about 190 members in perhaps 20 countries. We run hundreds of simultaneous studies. It's also the most productive clinical anesthesia research group. Since founding, the consortium has published 1,600 full papers. Put this in perspective for you, that's equivalent to every paper in every issue of a journal like Anesthesiology for 12 years running. So what would you say are some of the ways that the consortium is improving healthcare practices and interventions around the world? The, the major cause of death after surgery is myocardial injury, and major cardiac events. So we're very interested in risk factors. Uh, unfortunately, most of those are not modifiable. They're things like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, that, that we can't change. But some of the things we can change, and that includes blood pressure management. So we've, in the last decade, spent a, a lot of effort on blood pressure. Perhaps you could give us an example of, of um, a recent study that the uh, consortium has carried out that you're particularly proud of. Well, we just page, published a major trial in Lancet in which we randomized more than 5,000 patients to be either 35.5 degrees or 37 degrees at the end of surgery. Interestingly, there were no differences in cardiovascular outcomes, surgical site infections, or blood transfusions. These data indicate that temperatures as low as 35.5 degrees are safe in perioperative patients. What's your vision for the future of the Outcomes Research Consortium? Well, we are continuing to grow and we're doing more and more large trials. Large trials really matter. Uh, it's large trials that provide robust evidence that end up guiding clinical care and making sure that we do the right things for our patients. Our goal is to do lots of those trials. Well, Professor Sessler, thank you so much for joining us. That's all we've got time for, but uh, thank you for joining us and telling us so much more about the consortium and I uh, wish you a great meeting. Thank you so much. Some impressive research there from the Outcomes Research Consortium. Now, finally for today, Azaic's interactive workshops are always one of the real highlights of every Euro Anesthesia meeting. And this year, the Scientific Committee, together with a team of experts in simulation, are introducing a new learning methodology. It's based on gaming strategy and uses action and team play. It's time for serious games. Serious Games is brand new at Euro Anesthesia and we're taking problem-based learning and taking you into a fun, 
play environment, similar to an escape room. So you'll work through a case and the idea is to gather all the clues and all the information so that you can manage the case that we are going to be playing in that game if it were to land on you in your operating room. So they're going to be working with a team of people that they've probably never met before in a small group with a number of trainers who will be guiding them through the pathway. And after every individual game, there will be a debrief that will reinforce the learning points. So anesthesia is a team game. Whenever we come to an emergency, you can have a number of people all arriving at the same time all want to gather the information. We need to quickly establish clarity of roles, who is the leader, who's designating tasks. And we call this crisis resource management. And this is another strategy that will be um, reinforced during the games. We've decided to focus on cases that can happen anywhere. So these are not specialized technical skills that you're going to be learning. So for this reason, we've chosen pediatrics, a bleeding tonsil case, and for obstetrics, a hemorrhaging obstetric patient. They are um, very um, broad topics that many non-specialized anesthesiologists will need to manage. But we're certainly looking forward to future years where we might do either more specialized um, areas, for example, cardiac, We'd be delighted to see anybody from trainee up to super specialised level. And launching serious games at this year's Euro Anesthesia is another example of the continuous educational innovation strategies that Euro Anesthesia and ISAIC are um, supporting. And if you have an idea of a game that you think we should be um, an experience that you would like to have, we would love to hear from you. Well, that certainly looked like a lot of fun, and it's just fantastic to see Azaic pushing the frontiers of medical education. Well, that brings us to the end of our second show here at Euro Anesthesia 2022. But do join us again for much more tomorrow, when we'll be hearing the latest from the Azaic Trainee Committee, taking a look at top intensive care publications and getting hands-on training in the simulation lab. We'll see you then.